In the first chapter of the book, we developed the notion of the derivative and we had some applications of it. In the second chapter of the book, we developed the rules for differentiation and as we developed the rules, we looked at a bunch of applications of differentiation, of applications of the derivative, the instantaneous rate of change. In this third chapter, which is called applications, it's, um, we tend to lump together, or we have lumped together, some very specific types of problems. They're types of problems we've addressed throughout the book so far, but kind of more, uh, more sophisticated ones, and uh, they are traditionally lumped together so you can concentrate on the fundamentals of what goes into solving these types of problems. The good news is that in this chapter on applications, there aren't many new theorems and definitions. The bad news is that that's because almost everything we do is now some kind of complicated word problem, um, which isn't bad if you like word problems, but is, if you don't like word problems, it's probably pretty bad news. Um, so in this first section, in the third chapter, uh, the topic is related rates. Um, related rates just mean that is, <laughs> They're problems that deal with the fact that everything changes with time. And in a physical situation, everything is a function of time. As time goes on, everything changes. And so if you've got some quantities that are related at all times t in some open interval, then, and you have a formula giving you the relation, so inequality, that's an equality of functions of time. And you can differentiate each side of the equality with respect to time and you get um, a relationship between rates of change with respect to time. So in this section of the book, every time I say rate of change, I mean with respect to time, even if I don't say it explicitly. And that's what related rates have to do with. So let's just look at a problem, so a typical problem. So example one. So let's suppose we've got a barge. So something fairly flat, a barge um, in the water. I'll just draw it as a rectangle. And I've got a dock, and on the dock I've got some winch, and I've got a cable attached to the winch, and it's pulling in this barge. Okay, uh, this is clearly not drawn to scale, or this is a very big dock and a very small barge. Um, but I'm not really worried about the scale. There were some numbers I'd like to use. Let's suppose the dock is five feet out of the water and that the winch is three feet above the dock. Um, we're going to assume that as the winch, as the cable is pulled in, that the barge doesn't lift out of the water so that the picture is more or less like this. I'm going to call the distance between the dock and the barge X. And this distance, this length of cable that's out here, I'm going to call that distance r. So the cable is being reeled in. So this equals the length of the cable, which is changing with time, because the cable is being reeled in. And let's assume we're reeling in the cable at a rate of 5 feet per second. So, so we are. Um, reeling in the cable at 5 feet per second. My question is, how fast is the barge approaching the dock when the barge is 6 feet from the dock? So, when the barge is six feet from the dock. How fast is it approaching the dock? Okay, this is your typical related rates problem. It's, you've got some physical situation 
you've got some quantities that are clearly related by some mathematics, some geometry, something physical but that you can turn into equations. And you're given the rate of change of some of the variables, like we're given the rate of change of the length of the cable. And this, you're asked for the rate of change of the distance from the dock, essentially, um, at a certain point in time. What point in time? When the barge is six feet from the dock. So you're not, a time t is not specified, but that specifies some instant in this whole situation. So this is x equals the distance from the dock. All the distance units are in feet, the time units are in seconds. So this is our problem. And what do we need to do? We need to write an equation, an equality of functions of time, something that's true at all times in a, in a given interval. So well, what have we got? Well, at all times, this is 8 feet. That's not changing. This is x. That is changing. This is r, that's changing, but you always have the Pythagorean theorem, which would tell you that x squared plus 8 squared is r squared. That should be true at all times, at least until the, until the barge bumps into the dock or something else and the problem changes. But we get x squared plus 8 squared, which is 64, but that's kind of irrelevant right, for right now x squared plus 8 squared is r squared. This is true at all times t it, that we're interested in. So this is, this is an equality of functions of time. Right? x is changing with time, r is changing with time. Both of these are functions of time. And we're saying that they're equal at all times in some open interval. Equality of functions of time. Because it's an equality of functions, we can differentiate both sides with respect to time, so with respect to t, and we get an equality of new functions, the derivatives. So you differentiate both sides with respect to t. So you take the derivative with respect to t of x squared plus 8 squared, and this has to be the derivative with respect to t of r squared. Now the chain rule comes in. It's x is some function of t, and then there's some function done to that. So how do you differentiate using, you, know, you use the chain rule. You differentiate the outside function, squaring. The 2 comes down. You subtract 1 from the exponent, so you get 2x to the 1. That's a 1, not a prime. 2x to the 1, but then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside stuff. So times the derivative of x with respect to t. We don't know that. It's what, in fact, it's essentially what we're trying to find. Um, why am I saying essentially? I'll say that in a second. Derivative of 8 squared with respect to t. You might be tempted, tempted to use the power rule on it and say, it's, ah, it's 2 times 8 to the first power. No, it's a constant. It's 64. Its derivative is 0. It doesn't change with time. And here, you get something just like you got here. This is one function of t, and you've done another function to that. So you get this. So here's... Dividing both sides by 2, so there's another 2r to the 1, you get x dx dt equals r dr dt. This has to be true at all times t. What are we given? We're given that the cable's being reeled in at 5 feet per second. So we are given, we are given dr dt the rate of change of the cable length with respect to time. The cable length is decreasing. So dr dt is actually negative 5 feet per second. <clears throat> OK, negative because it's decreasing at 5 feet per second. All right, you're given that. We're after dx dt, except dx dt. If x is the distance, this x is actually decreasing also. So we'll get a negative number. It's negative the, the speed of the barge. So we actually want to calculate negative dx dt, because dx dt will be negative. So negative dx dt will be a positive number, which is what this question 
ask, how fast is it approaching? Um, you might think it's a question of English, and it is, but partly. That sh means a positive, the answer to this should be a positive number. How fast? We want some feet per second. So what we're being asked for is negative dx dt. When? Exactly when x is six feet. When the barge is six feet from the dock. So this is what we're after, negative dx dt when x is six feet. What we found is that what we have so far is that we had this equation. It's true at all times t, or until the barge bumps into the dock. We're not asking about what's going on there. We found that that gave us a relation between dx dt and dr dt. It gave us x dx dt. equals r dr dt, but we also know that dr dt dr dt is negative 5 feet per second. Okay, um, I've just realized that if I'm trying to follow the book, I have this reeling in the the cable far too fast. I put, I wrote five feet per second. What the book actually says is 0.5 feet per second. So I guess I'll go ahead and change that since it, we haven't used it at all yet. But yes, I misread the problem. I missed the decimal point. Actually, I thought that was a bit fast, five feet per second, half a foot per second. That's more reasonable. So the question is, what's dr dt? Uh, what's dx dt? Negative dx dt. When x is 6 feet. Um, you get this from the Pythagorean theorem. We're given this now that we've fixed it. And so what do we need? We, we divide both sides here by x. We get dx dt equals r over x times dr dt. We're after negative dx dt. That's negative this. That is, but we're after this when x is 6 feet. So we're after this when x is 6 feet. Well, when x is 6 feet, we know this. We know dr dt at all times t. If only we knew r when x is 6, we'd be all set. Oh. But now we can use this equation. When x is 6, we'd like to know what r is. <clears throat> when x equals 6, well, it's kind of rigged to be nice. You have a, you have a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. We have a 6, 8, 10 right, right triangle. You can check when x is 6, r would have to be 10 feet. Right, it's just, this is, it's not like it's a mystery. When x is 6, this is 36 plus 64. r is, so, so r squared is 100. r is plus or minus 10, but r is a length, so it's 10. All right, so we get that, which means you come back over here and you get negative r, which is 10 feet, divided by x, which is 6 feet, times negative So this is in feet per second. So what do we get? We get negative, negative. Those cancel. This is half. We get 5 sixth. It's coming in at 5 sixth of a foot per second. And that's our answer. This is a, a, a typical related rates problem. Um, it's, you know, this isn't, this is a fairly easy one. Um, but it's not too easy. I mean, you have, to know, you have to look at it and know to use the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it helps to draw a diagram if there's not one given to you. Uh, you get a, a single formula that relates two quantities, r and x. You could have more um, in a complicated problem. But in this one, you just have one formula, one equality relating r and x at all times t in some interval. 
You differentiate both sides with respect to t. You get the relation between the rates. That's why these problems are called related rates problems, and you solve. Um, it is important <coughs> to not differentiate things that are only true in an instant in time. So for instance, we're asked what happens when x is 6. That doesn't mean you should plug in x equals 6 here and then differentiate both sides, because then this side would be a constant. It's the equalities that you differentiate with respect to time have to be things that are true, at least for all t in some open interval of time. All right, let's look at a different problem. And let's see if I can copy down the numbers correctly this time. So suppose sand is falling in an hourglass. So our second example. Suppose sand is falling in an hourglass. But we know how fast it's falling in terms of volume. Suppose sand is falling in an hourglass. at the rate of at a rate of one cubic inch every five minutes. One cubic inch every five minutes. And that as the sand falls, it produces a conical pile. So as the sand falls, we're going to assume it produces a conical pile and that by, because of the nature of the sand and the shape of the hourglass, that the radius of the cone always equals the height. And I mean a right circular cone, if you've ever heard of any other kind of cone. A right circular cone, something that vaguely looks like this. And we're going to assume the height and the radius are always the same. And then my question is, how fast is the, rate, uh, is the height increasing? The height of the sand. Increasing. When the height is one inch. Okay, what do you have to know? What do you have to know to do this problem? Well, you're given something about the rate of change of the volume, right? Because you're told how much sand is coming in in cubic inches per second. Cubic inches, that's volume. And so you need to know something about volume, and so you need to know the formula for the volume of a cone. Um, I don't know if you know the formula for the volume of a cone, but it's one-third the area of the base times the height. So the volume of this cone is one-third the area of the base times the height. But the area of the base, the base is a circle of radius r. So the area of the base pi r squared, and the height is h. So that's the formula for the volume of the cone. But then we're told that the sand is falling in such a way that the radius and the height are always the same. And we're asked something about the height. So we're told that the radius is always equal to the height. So this is true at all times. This volume of the cone is something that's true at all times. And then we're also told that the rate at which sand is falling, so this should is the rate of change of the volume with respect to time, that this is one-fifth of a cubic inch per minute. 
So our times in this problem are all in minutes. All our distance measurements are in inches. And what we're being asked for is, what is dh dt? The rate of change of the height with respect to time when the height is one inch. Again, this is standard and related rates problems. You're given some problem. You have possibly some diagram. You need to produce some formulas that are true at all times. In this problem, we have two, but they're very simple. Well, one's very simple. You have to know the formula for the volume of a cone, or be given it. One third the area of the base times the height. But then we're also told that the radius and the height are always the same. We're given dv dt, and we're asked for dh dt. But we're not asked for dh dt as a function of time. We're just asked for dh dt at a specific instant in time. When? When the height of the cone is one inch. Of course, that'll make the radius of the cone one inch. So we, both, we'll know both, we know both the height and the radius, the time that we care about. So how do you do this problem? Uh, it's easy at this point. So r equals h, and we're asked something about dh dt. We could write v, the volume. Since r equals h, we could either replace r with h here or h with r. But we want something about dh dt, so let's write v in ter terms of h. So we get, this is one-third pi r squared, but r is the same as h, h squared times h. So one-third pi h cubed. So there's a, a formula that's true at all times t, and you differentiate both sides with respect to time. Keeping in mind that both v and h are functions of t, so here you'll need the chain rule. What do we get? We get dv dt equals... And we're differentiating this with respect to t. We get the one-third pi. This is one function of t, and we've done another function of that. You do the chain rule. You get three times h squared. By the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside function, which is h, with respect to time. So times dh dt. The threes cancel, and we get the dv dt is pi h squared dh dt. But now this is easy. So we've got dv dt equals pi h squared dh dt. We're given that dv dt is one-fifth of a cubic inch per minute. And we're asked for dh dt when h is one. So when h is one inch, we would have we have what? We have dv dt. Is, I'm going to drop the units until the end now. Everything's consistent. We have one-fifth equals pi times one squared times dh dt. So what we get, divide both sides by pi. You get dh dt when h is one inch is 1 over 5 pi, uh, which is approximately, I cheated and did this on a calculator, is approximately 0 0.06366 units, those units, those divided by those units, inches per minute. Okay. This, again, is a pretty standard related rates problem. Um, let's look at one more. There's an infinite number of related rates problems. Uh, just, you know, there are just an infinite number of word problems that give you relations between the rates of change of time. There's no way to get good at these without doing a bunch of them. Um, you know, there are, there are two big steps. One is changing the words into math, and then the other step is solving the math problem.
All right, but let's look at one more that's different, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I guess it's slightly harder than the other two, but not ridiculously harder. So suppose we've got two airplanes that are moving on perpendicular paths. So I'll say there's airplane A. So here's, this is plane A. Here's plane B. And this plane is moving, well, if we have x and y axes, it's moving, it, you know, there's a top view. That plane, we're assuming they're at the same altitude. That plane is moving, you, know, you could say it's due north. And this one's moving due east. And how fast are they moving? I pick some numbers. Let's assume that this is 300 miles per hour constantly. And this is 200 miles per hour. My question is, so you can look at the distance between the two planes. So R. The question, so the distance between the planes. And if you've got that line segment drawn in, you can look at this angle theta. So the angle that the ray from this plane to that plane makes with the, well, with what's the positive x-axis. And this, and the question is, um, how fat, when, so at a particular instant in time, when x is 30 miles, so what's x? Yes, what is x? Let's call this x. So we're measuring distances from this intersection of their paths. Call this distance x and this distance y. When x is 30 miles and y is 40 miles, how fast? At what rate? Say it, at what rate? At what rate is the distance between the planes increasing? And at what rate is the distance between the planes increase, increasing? And at what rate is the angle theta changing? All right. OK. What do you do? Well, <laughs> you have to write some formulas relating things. Sometimes there are lots of choices. Um, it can be hard to know what to use. Certainly we could use the Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus y squared will always be r squared. That certainly seems like it would be a good thing to use. Um, we're told dx dt is 300 miles per hour. We're told dy dt is 200 miles per hour. So, and we're asked for the rate of change of the distance between the planes. We're asked for dr dt, so it certainly seems reasonable that um, we should write the Pythagorean, what we get from the Pythagorean theorem, namely the equation that relates x, y, and r, and that's true at all times t. So x squared plus y squared equals r squared. If we want something about the angle theta, we're going to need to write an equation that involves the angle theta also. We have a bunch of choices. We could use sine, cosine, or tangent, reasonably. Um, uh, you know, if we use sine, you'd take the opposite side over the, the sine of theta, you'd use the opposite side over the hypotenuse. 
we take the cosine of theta, you take the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. If you take um, the tan of theta, you take the opposite side over the adjacent. It doesn't really matter which one we use. Um, I'll go ahead and use tangent. But it wouldn't be wrong to use sine or cosine. Um, sometimes you write down equations that you don't use later, too. Um, but let's write down tan theta is always y over x. As long as x isn't 0 and we're not doing the problem anywhere near where x is 0, we're interested in when x is 30, so this is fine. Okay. Um, what do you get? Okay. Well, these equations are true at all times t. And you can differentiate both sides with respect of both equations with respect to t. So let's see what we get. If you differentiate both sides of this with respect to time, keep in mind x is a function of time, y is a function of time, r is a function of time. We haven't written down the individual functions, x is a function of time, or y is a function of time, or r is a function of time. But we can still differentiate this equation with respect to t, knowing that x, y, and r are functions of t. So what do you get? Well, like in before, you get this is one function of t and another function done to that. You get 2x dx dt. And then the derivative here, with respect to t, 2y dy dt. The derivative of r squared, 2r dr dt. You divide both sides by 2, just because. And you get x dx dt plus y dy dt equals r dr dt. We're given dx dt and dy dt. We're asked for dr dt when x and y have specific values. So we know all four of these quantities. To get dr dt, we would need to know r when x is 30 and y is 40. Well, again, I picked a nice Pythagorean triple. We have that x squared plus y squared is r squared. And a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. In fact, I picked the same Pythagorean triple. 3, 4, 5 right triangle. When this is 30 and this is 40, r would be 50. <coughs> so when I'm going to drop the units, uh, distance units are in miles, times, and hours. When x is 30 y and y is 40, r is 50. And so we can plug in everything. This is, I'm only writing this when x is 30 and y is 40. Then this x is 30 dx dt. We were given dx dt. It was 300 miles per hour plus y. y is 40 when we care about this. And dy dt, we were given that at all times, dy dt is 200 miles per hour. And this has to equal r, which we just found was 50, times dr dt. OK, so what do you do? Well, you multiply this out, and you divide by, you divide by 50. Um, if you do that, you'll get that dr dt is, so you solve this. And you find dr dt, I'm just going to cram it in here, dr dt, I'll let you do it, but dr dt at this point in time is 340 miles per hour. Okay, um, so that's dr dt. We want d theta dt at the same time. And I don't think it's really going to fit in here, but we'll see. So, okay, what do you get for d theta dt? Well, we'll differentiate both sides of this with respect to t. So what do you get? All right, derivative of tangent is secant squared. But, you know, this is a function of t. And then we've done another function of that. We've taken tangent. So you differentiate the outside function, leaving the inside thing the way it was. The derivative of tangent, secant squared. You leave the inside stuff just sitting there happily being theta. But then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside function. That's theta of t. And its derivative with respect to t? d theta dt. 
And then this equals, these are two functions of t, and you have to use the quotient rule. It is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Okay, you get that. All right, and we're after d theta dt, so we divide both sides by secant squared theta and plug stuff in. One nice thing you can do is use one of our trig identities. Tan squared plus one is secant squared. They're secant squared. It's tan squared plus one. You don't have to do what I'm about to do, but it's certainly nice. Um, secant squared is tan squared plus one. So I'm using the tan squared theta plus one is secant squared theta. Okay, um, so what do you get when you use that? You get that, oh, tan squared plus one is this. So y over x quantity squared, so tan squared is this, plus one is secant squared, d theta dt equals x dy dt minus y dx dt over x squared. So the nice thing about doing that was that it gives us this relationship. And once we put this stuff over there, we'll have d theta dt just in terms of x and y and dx dt and dy dt. And we know all of those things. So we don't ever have to use a tr do a trig function on our calculators or any other way that you might deal with a trig function. So we should be able to do this by hand. So maybe I'll write it right here. So what do you do? Well, this is the same as y squared over x squared. But then you can write 1 as x squared over x squared. So you get the common denominator of x squared, so this is y squared plus x squared over x squared. Why do that? Because we're going to divide both sides by this, which is the same as inverting and multiplying it, and that means that when you invert this and multiply, that x squared down there will cancel with this one, or think, multiply both sides of the equation by x squared first, and then divide by x squared plus y squared. One way or the other, what you should see is that d theta dt is x dy dt minus y dx dt, all divided by x squared plus y squared, um, which was r squared. We don't need to know that it was r squared, but, but you could use that that's r squared. All right, so what do we get for d theta dt? When x is 30, again, in miles, and y is 40. This will come out in radians per second. Oh, radians per hour, sorry. Our time units, definitely hours, not seconds. Right? Um, so this will come out in radians per hour. What do we get? We get d theta dt is 30 times dy dt, dy dt was given to us, 200 miles per hour, minus 40 times dx dt, dx dt was given to us, it's 300 miles per hour, over 30 squared plus 40 squared, which is 50 squared, so over 2,500, or so 900 plus 1,600, 2,500. What do we get? Oh, I don't know. You get... Uh, 6,000 minus 12,000 over 2,500. So that is minus 6,000, but we'll cancel some zeros. So we get minus 60 over 25. Minus six, well, so we get minus 6,000 over 2,500, but then I canceled. You know, divided the numerator and denominator by 100. 
So minus 60 20 fifths, or if you now multiply the numerator and denominator by four, you can get minus, why do that? To get 100 in the denominator. So you get minus 240 over 100, but now we can convert that to a decimal easily because it's just 240 divided by 100. That's minus 2.4, minus 2.4 watts, radians per hour. And that's how fast the angle's changing. Okay, um, these are just examples of related rates problems. Um, presumably, you'll, you know, when you have to do some problems, they won't be exactly these three. You know, you'll have to use different formulas, or some formulas will be given to you. And you'll have a different kind of word problem. You have to translate the words that you're given into equations, so into mathematics. Presumably, it better be that some of the equations give you, or some of the words give you equations that hold at all times, um, and that you're get, some of the data that you're given should be rates of change of some of the quantities, and what you're asked for should be a rate of change of another quantity, and then you differentiate the equations that you're given with respect to time, or with the equations you develop. You differentiate both sides with respect to time, assuming the equations held at all times in some open interval containing the time at which that you care about, you differentiate both sides with respect to time, and you get a relation between the rates. And then you plug in the rates you know and the values of the variables at the time that you care about, and you solve for the rate that you're after. No two of these are the same. You just have to do a bunch of them to get used to it.